Welcome to the Speedway Chat Show hosted by Jerry Sims and Wilbur Hancock. We would like to say a massive thank you to all our partners that make the show possible. Make sure you like, comment, and share our videos. It helps get Speedway in front of more people. To watch the show live and engage with the guests, tune in at 7.30 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Enjoy, buckle up, and get ready for our awesome ride. Hey guys, it's Wednesday afternoon and we have another Speedway Chat Show. I, uh, how are you, Will? Be you all good? Yeah, I'm all great. How are you, Jez? Yeah, good. We had a few technical issues right at the very uh, beginning there. And uh, I just got to check because it doesn't look like we're going live on Facebook right now for some unknown reason. I do not know why that is. Um, so we are live on YouTube, but it's not going live on Facebook for some reason. Um, two seconds. Um, how are you? What, what have you been up to today? Um, not much, genuinely. I've, I've just been doing school since like 8 a.m. this morning, so <laughs> nothing too crazy. I'm excited for today's show. Um, Mark has been a legend of the sport, and uh, I'm expi- I haven't spoke to, to Mark in a while, so it's going to be fun to, you know, catch up with him and see how it's going to go. For sure. Um, I have just added us to Facebook, so let's see if that works. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you to um, Speculate to Accumulate for all of their help for everything they do to make these shows uh, possible. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Sorry we are seven minutes late, which not don't normally do that, but... Uh, Let's uh, bring Mark on. Yes, let's do it. Two seconds. There he is. Hey, Mark, how are you? Can you hear us? Yeah. Oh, no, you? Sorry, I've, I've had a bit of trouble with the sound. Is it all right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all good. good. Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, yeah, well, just before the show started, Wilbur... Wilbur hadn't uh, connected to the to the show, and then when we spoke to Mark, he was having problems with his headphones. Um, but hopefully, we're all going to be good now. So uh, you, you can hear us now, Mark. You're all good. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit yeah, it's breaking up a little bit, but we're all all right at the moment. We'll crack on. Okay, cool. So, um, 2000 World Champion. Um, that's uh, one hell of a hell of a feat to uh, to be, obviously become world champion. Um, you did it in a time where you uh, you actually didn't win a Grand Prix in the year that you won the, the World Championship. You know, um, that's, uh, uh, has it never been done before? Was, that, was you the only Sorry, person to do I'm that? Struggling to, oh. struggling, struggling to hear you a little bit. Um, I did get the gist of the of the question. Um, yeah, it was in the time they'd kind of... Um, started a new point system and i guess a couple of years later they changed it because they didn't like the fact that someone can be consistent maybe not win a round but then can still win overall but that particular year um obviously it suited me and um it worked out for me i think it could have worked out for quite a few different riders over the year but um yeah it's, it, it was what it was and it, that's the rules at the time so i was lucky enough to yeah. take advantage of them and uh, that was good yeah, for sure. I mean, whoever wins the most points surely should be the person who, who wins overall. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's it's like everything I've said before, that um, I was in it racing in an era with, you know, the likes of um, Tony, Crumpy, Greg, Lee Adams, Gollub, you know, some of them, you know, in my opinion, of the decade, the, the, the best riders about, so... 
Um, it was never going to be easy to win a world title for, away from any one of them. Um, but obviously the, the manner in which I've done it is different, but there's no change in the fact that I've done it. So, um, <laughs> so I'm quite pleased to be able to say that. Yeah, yeah for sure. They, they can never take your name off that trophy. <laughs> No, that's it. No, it's on there now, well and truly. <laughs> Actually, I've still got the trophy because the year after, they changed it. To be to be fair, the first few years, or certainly up to 2000 when I won it, the, the World Championship trophy that you got to keep for one year really wasn't very good. So I think they realised that. So I was lucky enough to keep it, but there's nothing to write home about. <laughs> and, and, where does, and where does that sit now? Say again, buddy? Where, where is the trophy? In your house or...? I still have my trophy. Yeah, yeah, in my house, and we've got uh, like an office with a trophy room, you know. Um, so I say it's got pride of place. But to be honest with you, there's a lot of other trophies that are in there that are um, far more uh, interesting and glamorous to look at, uh, as opposed to that particular one, which isn't, yeah, you know, I'd say, isn't really much to write home about. Yeah, I, I for looked sure. on, on your Wikipedia page, you're like 89, you won the National League Riders' Championship. Uh, 91, you won the South African Championship. Is that right? You're, you're South African champion in 1991? Yeah, I, I guess they, they called it that. Um, it was more of a South African Open because I think the actual championship was probably only open to South African nationals. But we were over there touring that year, having a lot of fun. Um, with uh, There was me, Rob Tilbury, Chris Louie, uh, Neville Tatum. Kelly Moran thrown in, just for good measure, you can imagine, can't you? I I'd, um, I was actually 17 when I flew there, so I couldn't take part in the first meeting, but then as soon as I turned 18, I um, I rode. You was all yeah, good. Like a good South African Open Championship. It's fair to say I won it, but probably not South African champion, to be fair. <laughs> um. Can you uh, can you tell us a story about what happened at the stoplight or no stop sign? No, Sorry, buddy. Um, you've I got I got, that one. Sorry. I got I got told a story earlier about when you um, there was a stop sign in South Africa when you first got there. Can you tell everybody what happened about the stop sign? Um. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, we, we, we were getting into a lot of trouble, really. Um, <laughs> you can imagine the load of us, we were, we were just, yeah, we had a hire car and we were just tearing around like lunatics and, and we used to do sort of like a bit of off-roading, really. The, a lot of the dirt lanes back to um, Peter Prinsloo uh, was, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun late at night, really, and got in a lot of trouble and ended up having to literally do a bit of panel beating on the hire car um, before we took it back because, uh, you yeah, know, it was in a bit of a state. But luckily, Chris Louie was with us and he was a bit of a dab hand at the old panel B and started coming handy. That's, <laughs> that's not the story that Chris told me earlier. He told me that you run a stop sign or something and you guys got arrested. Um, but then you was asked where, where you were staying and you were like, well, I don't know. We don't know because you'd only just got there. We've not been there yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, that, so, then, so then you... They actually, they actually locked you guys up, and the promoter had to come and bail you out because <laughs> you genuinely didn't know where you were staying, and you were just there in South Africa. <laughs> yeah, it was right in the centre. Yeah, I remember now. It was right in the centre of. We was uh, in a in a hotel in Hillbrow, right in the centre of Johannesburg, which probably not the place you'd stay there now. But um, yeah, we we got in got in trouble for that. But also, uh, um, I was. I thought it'd be great to drive into Soweto one day, which is like a township. And um, when when we got pulled over on driving into there, and the police said to us, "Ask us what the what the hell are you doing?" And um, you know you, you shouldn't really be going into Soweto. We so we'll go. Thought we we're going to have a look, you know. And um, when I when he asked for my um, paperwork and license, I leant across to open the, the glove box, and they just pulled guns on us because obviously we didn't realise that you can have firearms out there. So as soon as I <laughs> bent across, they thought I was maybe pulling a gun out. So next thing I know, look, with these guns shoot, um, pointing to us through the window, and that I'll crap myself to be honest. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and um, apparently there was a there was a Mark Laram and Chris Louis handbrake uh, school of handbrake turns. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I and mean, we kept kept rolling the tires yeah. off the rim, so we got uh, big Steve Girdwood who was with us, like filming. You know, we got some old VHS video footage of it um, of uh, Steve. We had to balance the car because we'd run out of tires because the spare had already been rolled off the rim. So I remember driving through at like nine o'clock in the morning after being in the uh, the, the clubhouse bar all night, um, driving back, and he's sitting on the opposite corner to weigh the car over and he's sitting on the corner of the boot driving through the town reading his paper while we drive through with his flat tire with his bloke sitting on the boot it was quite funny <laughs> that is funny um so we see here that you uh both you and joe joe screen uh got a maximum in poland for riding for chesakova in the last race you actually rode joe's bike you swap bikes. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, swap so, bikes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, to be fair, when we first years ago, when like it was me, Joe, um, Lee Adams, uh, Hans Nielsen, there was a handful of us going to Poland in the days when it was real early. And to be fair, in them days, with the greatest respect, the, the local riders were good, but they possibly didn't quite have the 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 pace and and the equipment that we had in them days, and and that just shows goes to show that. Um, me and me and Joe both were on maximum, so we 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 swapped bikes to do heat fifteen, and um, I think I'm pretty sure we still ended up on on maximum pay maximum. But yeah, he said he said you got a paid max. Doing, yeah. yeah, I don't think you could get away with doing that these days. Them boys are too good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so pretty much all the people that I've spoken to have some sort of car related story about you. I spoke to a few people in the last couple of days. And um, is there any other stories where you got pulled over the, by the police in a foreign country? Yeah, um, we were going to a Grand Prix. We got guns pulled on us again. There's a pattern for me. Um, uh, there was, I think it was me and Stone, Carl Stone here. Um, a few of the boys were all in a minibus going to, we'd fl flown... We'd, we'd ridden in England the night before and we were flying out to practice and the plane got delayed. So the guy was speeding, um, uh, obviously, in the VO people carrier. And again, that was the time when we got pulled over. And I think Stoney might have been giving the policeman a little bit of, a little bit of lip. And um, that's another another time where we had, they started reaching for their guns and getting the right up with us. So um, I've had quite a few uh, altercations with uh uh, firearms in Speedway. We we went. I went with Simon Wig. Bless him. Years ago, he organised a a meeting for us to race in Togliati, like well before any foreigners were going there. And um, we flew over there. And uh, the guy that runs Megalada in them days was quite an influential character, I think, in the Russian politics side. And when we flew over to do this meeting to celebrate his birthday. We were supposed to be out with him for a meal the night before and, and um, unfortunately, we, well, fortunately, we were late for the meal, so we didn't make it. But when we got there, we were told the the news that um, the guy we were going out to celebrate his birthday, this guy that runs Megalada, had, um, had been assassinated outside the restaurant, which is just um, no unbelievable. When he, we, yeah, we went, we went into the, the hotel which is pretty basic when we're talking in the late, late eight, no, it was early 90s, I think it was 94, 95, and um, there was a guy come in again, the copper, and he said, there's been some mischief in the town, and and we sort of looked at each other and thought, oh, who's been out on the piss and got in trouble or something and got locked up? And um, it ended up, they come out and said that this guy, um, the, the the director or whatever, Megalard, had been shot the night before. And when we went to the, the track that day, they carried on with the meeting and made it more of a memorial rather than anything. But it was all, it was awful, really, because his car was just parked in the pits with all the bullet holes in, and uh, all the you could no see his shirt was laid in the back seat, and it was just covered in blood. You see, it was just unbelievable. So it's, that was definitely sticking the memory. That one. Holy moly! Imagine wow. you just you're going for a birthday party and you end up going to a memorial instead. <sighs> It's a whole, lo whole load of different uh, emotions there, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> wow. Holy crap. It was the eeriest well, thing because there was uh, this stadium probably held ten to 12,000 people and we were obviously racing against um, Togliatti's team 
um, Sergei Irishin's one of the riders I was in Australia with that I remember. And um, rather than it being a birthday celebration, it was 12,000 people dressed in black holding candles when we walked out on parade. And it was the most scariest moment. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I think at that time, Wiggy, I think Simon Wig turned around us and said, whatever happens, I think we'd better let him win. <laughs> 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 well so the story that i was that i was um thinking that you was going to tell um is is a little bit light-hearted more light-hearted than that one um but uh joe <laughs> screen was telling me about the higher car that you had in australia when you was there for the ivan major long track um and he said that you went down the one-way street and you got pulled over by the cops then yeah we we were yeah as usual we were a little bit naughty so we it, Oh, we've been out. I think we'd done, you know, like going too silly. We'd have a, had a few beers and we're driving down um, on, my, on our way somewhere and went up the uh, one way, wrong way up the one way street. And um, I think I had this t shirt on that the, the policeman found a bit offensive. I think he said something about, uh, in different terms, you know, screw work before it screws you or something. It was, a, it was a 90s T-shirt from uh, one of the skateboarding uh, sort of crews that made, made that sort of thing. And um, I remember the copper, he, I was a bit concerned because I had a couple of free beers, not too many, but then I jumped out of the car and he came up to me and he said, oh, you know, I thought I was going to be in trouble for the offence, but what he made me do was take the T-shirt off and turn it inside out. <laughs> and then he randomly just let me get back in the car and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Joe also did say he looks forward to having a catch up with you sometime soon. It's been too long. Yeah, I see it. Um, we actually spoke, uh, I gave him a ring yesterday. Um, just to catch up. Oh, I spoke to him the day before. <laughs> yeah, the day before, that's it. Yeah, so like, when you get to my age, yeah. mate, they're all rolling up. Wow. Yeah, no, I say, I, I'm saying I spoke to him just the day before. Well, yeah, possibly. Yeah, so we, uh, we spoke about having a catch up and maybe having a ride in March somewhere and having a bit of a mess about. I haven't been on a bike since 2011, so I think that'd be, um, I've been meaning to do it, you know, but it's just getting around to it. So I think we need to pencil something in and get it done. Yeah. Just pull do a crumpy, it? just make a comeback. Oh, mate. Yeah. How can you imagine that? Fair play to him, mate. I mean, he's, <laughs> I don't know, I'll just take me out off to him. Um, you know, <clears throat> obviously he's kept his hand in it, his hand in it really. Which is going to keep himself fit, and I think Seth doing a lot of you know road racing and that he's around it all the time. But for yeah. me, it's it's been a t complete, total, different life really since I've finished riding. So I've had to carve a way out in business for myself. So it's been really difficult already to um, sort of get round to doing that really and getting, out and getting the bike out. I've still got the bikes, but it's getting them out and actually getting that time to drive an hour and a half from where I am to actually you know what it's like in England. You, a bit different where Wilbur and that is if, if he's in California you can you can pretty much drive out to the salt flats and ride any any time you want not not be bothered by anyone you know but it's just really yeah. difficult around here really yeah so cool. how how is life now compared to when you was racing you're traveling all over the place and you know all over the continent even well even all over the world Australia and South Africa and things like that and then now um like what, what are you up to now for the fans that don't know? Well, I got when I finished, when I knew I, I, obviously the injuries were too bad and it was going to be um, a bit of a non starter with me being able to ride again. Um, I had to then switch my mind to business. And all the time I was riding, I used to buy and sell cars in the winter and um, do a number of different things. And I was renovating the house that I, you know, that I bought, as, which has always been my nest egg, really. It's a farm with a fair bit of land. Um, so it was always a lot of work to do, but going back to the cars, that was really my first interest in life was cars. So natural progression was I went on to buy and sell BMW cars, um, moved on now to running a workshop where there's um, me and uh, four of us uh, basically independently repairing BMW cars, obviously at a lesser cost than main dealer, um, break a lot of parts now. And um, it's gone on from there really, it's growing from year to year. So. That's kept me busy and kept me focused, really, because I don't think I would like to have had to have finished Speedway without something there in the background ready to work on. You know, I think it would have been it would have been very difficult because it's a massive part of my life. And um, 
and I had such a good time doing it and it got so much to be thankful for. Um, if I had it just switched off, I think I might have just ground to a halt. So luckily I had something to drive myself on, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, there's, uh, who else did we speak to? We spoke to Lawrence Hare, who uh, had a few uh, funny stories for us. Um, he was telling us about uh, the, the Honda Melody that's on the Woodward farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, was a, there was a lot of stories said, on the, we, we used to We used to share a workshop, you know, um, me, Lowell, Dewey, Savalas, Clouting, and a number of other writers, and then Tony Ricardson had his sort of UK workshop there, and yeah, you can imagine what's going on, especially with Lowell and Dewey at the time, obviously <laughs> Lowell pre-accident. Um, they just, I mean, mate, one day they turned up with a CR500 motocross sidecar and thought it'd be a great idea to get this thing running and start riding it around the <laughs> riding it around the, the, the yard you know and obviously Dewey and Lowell were good motocrossers you know and um yeah I just thought they were going to kill each other it, obviously <laughs> Lowell wouldn't let Dewey drive and then Dewey just <laughs> getting, me up, getting me up with him like I thought those typical brothers they're going to end up killing each other soon <laughs> it's brilliant brilliant uh, Dewey actually told me about uh, he borrowed he borrowed a bike off of you a motocross bike, is that right? He was like in, he said he was in between bikes. He borrowed a bike off of you and you let him have a ride on it and he he cased a jump and uh, he said it was a big off. I think he broke some ribs and things like that and he he wasn't in a very good place. He said but you all sort of went off afterwards and he was like, well it's all right. I took most of the damage myself. Um, and I only really scraped the mud guard. So he goes, oh, well, I'll sort the mud guard out. But as the as the day had gone on, you'd found one thing after another, after another, after another. And he was like, I pretty much felt I, I needed to buy him a new bike because the, the whole bike was actually wrecked. But on, <laughs> yeah. on the first first look, it, was, uh, yeah. it wasn't that bad. Just, yeah, it was just the mud guard, he reckons. But I think the subframe was bent. Handlebars were bent. And I, <laughs> it, was, it was near enough brand new bike. Obviously, do it riding at a way quicker pace than me. I, I would have done anyway. But, um, yeah, it was a bit of a standing joke because I sort of said, yeah, you just broke the mudguard, didn't you? Done about a grand's worth of damage. <laughs> That's funny. So speaking uh, about the future of, of, uh, of Speedway and British Speedway in general, um, would you ever consider being a team manager, uh, mentor for younger riders, uh, anything like that for, for the sport in the future? Do you know what, Will? I've, I've, I've always thought about to do some, uh, you know, within the sport. The, the problem was, um, I don't want to sound like a thing, but because I didn't go into it probably early, straight after my career, where I could have gone into doing roles, um, the, the roles weren't right in the way that the money wasn't there to spend on the, the youth, which is what I would like to have got involved in. But so. I was asked to like be an under-21 coach pretty much when I was still on crutches. And um, I kind of said, yeah, I'd like to do that. But for anyone to succeed in English Speedway or in the world Speedway thing, you have to make it in Poland and Sweden. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but that's the way it is. You can look at the differences. Plenty of really good young riders, but unless they make that transition to the continent, like Greg, like Lee, Chris Louie, all, a lot of riders did. There's an awful lot of riders that were every bit as good as us that didn't make it in yeah. Poland and Sweden. And that's the stepping stone to the to the top level. So my idea was well, we need to take two van loads of bikes with the young English riders to Poland, Sweden, and do match races. The problem I had at the time, and I'm sure it's different now because they seem to have a really good professional setup now, but as soon as I said we need a budget to be able to take mechanics, three or four vans, all the bikes, the riders, do a three or four week training camp and then have um, match races with the local under-21s. And that's the last I ever heard of it <laughs> because <laughs> as soon as you mentioned the budget and money, um, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, I just sat waiting for the reply and nothing ever came back. So hence, I've never been involved in anything um, because it wasn't a budget for me. I didn't, I didn't want any money for doing it. Mm -hmm. All I wanted was 
to pay someone my wage while I wasn't there, I'd quite happily do it for nothing. But what we did want is a budget to be able to do what we're set out to do, and that's to get riders riding abroad and succeeding where they need to be to make that step up to the Grand Prix level or, you know, the best the best sort of top flight level they can possibly do, you know? Mm -hmm. So if they approached you with, with some kind of a plan, do you think you would uh, still now want to help out with it? Or do you feel like I don't? Uh, you don't really know what you could what you could offer. Um, I think I could still possibly help out. I think speedways changed a lot since I rode, um, but I think I could possibly help out. Um, but the difference is now what needs to be done. Whereas at the time they didn't. Days, I don't know whether there was a denial or whether they just point blank didn't didn't really maybe want to put the effort in. But the difference is now they seem to want to put the effort in. And I think mm -hmm. the boys that are involved with the under-21 um, package in England now is good, but I still don't think they're doing enough riding, looking from where I am, they're doing enough riding in Poland, Sweden, because that's where you have to make, that's where you have to really make your um, make your mark to be, like you say, to, to be carrying on to the next level. So I don't, I'm not so sure they really need my help now, but, I'm, you know, I'm always here and... Um, but the phone don't ring, so I'm quite happy as yeah. I am. <laughs> I've gone from the busiest man charging around the world three or four times a week, flying here, there, and everywhere. 140 meetings from October and November. Now I don't leave Suffolk. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do you think it's very important to be very strong mentally as well as on the bike? Do you feel like you since I mean you you had a hell of a career. You, you know, became world champion and. And um, you could give a lot of advice to younger riders that don't have the head straight, or do you feel like you would rather focus more on the riding riding abilities? Um, what's your take on that? You know what, you're, you're dead right because there's a lot more men um, uh, in my road to be the fair in, in them days. I mean, it was different. You know, it was a competitive side together. We rode in Sweden against each other, and then we ride in Poland, each you know, you know, on the same team. Um, nowadays, I think psychologically and obviously the fitness-wise is something that really has come into it. Um, you know, it's got so much more serious on that side. And I actually wasn't a very confident rider in my day, believe it or not. Um, I, I had, I think, I had the natural ability to go on and win more meetings. But I didn't have that killer instinct and that competitive edge that you needed. I was lucky that I got by on my natural ability and my sheer want to win races. Mm -hmm. But if I had have had a more um, focused uh, brain on me, I think I would have done a lot better. And that's why I think you're right. And these days, it needs to be there, and it needs it's all part package. You can be as talented as you want, but I think you do need them other aspects now. Which we might have played with years ago, you know. For sure. We we spoke to Ty Wuffenden before and he was talking about like marginal gains and he's like sometimes he'll, he'll work on something just to get that one or two percent extra. But if he does five different things that have one or two percent extra, he's he's at ten percent faster than he was the year before. You know, so being ten percent faster than than the other people he's racing against is gonna be a a massive help yeah ties ties a great um, a, a great one to look at from this aspect because he's not only has he got the natural ability he, he can ride anything inside out um he has got that you know that that fine thing being don't you see nicky's he's not a talented rider as well. i've told him this before so i'm not saying out to nicky's <laughs> nicky's done what he's done by being in being sure brute force and ignorance his actual talent on a bike is not as good as probably most of the other riders but the difference here is up here he's incredibly strong and he will get you know one way shape or form even i just said to me years ago years ago because he used to really help me out mentally with a lot of stuff because he'd be believable um, I find it so ironic what happened to Ivan when he used to tell me stories of stuff and he used to know 
1971, gate four, I had a 68 two sprocket on, I don't miss that now. And I would just be sat there going, Ivan, how the fuck do you remember all this? I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> and to think we knew we lost Ivan to his memory is um, is really quite sad. But going back to like the thing with Nicky and Ty has got the best balance of talent and mental his, his mental perception true. on the sport and what he yeah. thinks. And he, he, he's got the best mix. And that's why at the moment um, I think he's he's the he's the Jason Crump or the Tony Ricardson of our era at the moment. But I mean, look at look at Smarz. Where's like, Nick? <laughs> yeah, um, look yeah, at look at Smarz. Like, I mean, wow, he has almost a whole field beat on the track mentally already, so that they almost can put in their heads that what am I supposed to do to get second? You know, I mean, he's so quick and so fast that the only way you're really going to get around him is if he makes a mistake. And that's, I mean, he, he's so, me and my dad have talked about this so many times is that he knows the bike so well that he can drive down the straight off the back fender and then go into the next turn and know exactly what to do with that momentum, right, that he has and know exactly what to do because he's like, oh, I've been here in this situation before. I mean, imagine how many laps he's put on that bike just in practice or just on 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 uh, just just for himself you know he gets to know the bike so well that he he's comfortable in whatever situation he has to be in and the only times he really does a mistake is when he overthinks himself and then he you just see that he gets up and he walks by and you can see the, like his emotions in his face like i want that's i get now what, what happened what if i do that right and if he does that he's not going to do it again you know or if he does that he's going to figure out a different way to fix it. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, Smarslik, he's, he's incredible as well. I mean, he, he's just, not only is he good at what he does, he's, he, he puts bums on seats, he's incredible. There isn't, a, there isn't a Speedway fan, including myself, won't pay money to watch that man on a bike. He's incredible. Yeah. But you know what, I really, what really impressed me about him is his fact, his, his ability to turn meetings around from being from crashing his brains out to getting up in, in, in a high pressure situation, and he gets back on and he just reels off three straight wins and pulls it straight back. You know, he's he, he's he's absolutely incredible, and and that's that's what made him a world champion. I think by his head not dropping. You know, in, in, in I think that last round where he, he you know crashed his brains out and everyone thought, oh, his head's going to drop now. Not a chance. Yeah, yeah. And I think ties like yeah. that in a lot of ways, you know. The ability to rush, brush yourself off and carry on. Yeah, I remember um, Crumpy was the same. You know, I, I remember watching Crumpy and, you know, he has a big crash at the beginning of the meeting and you're like, look out now because he's like wound up and he was just, you know, he, he'd pull it out of the bag once, you know, once he's had a big injury. Yeah. Um, so so do, you, um, do, do you still go to Speedway? Like, are you ever... I think it switches your closest track, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I probably went to Ipswich half a dozen times, obviously, the, the season before last when it was still running. Um, yeah, I still try and go as much as I can, but um, it's just, it's a bit of a job because, because although I'm quite close to it, it's about half an hour drive. By the time I finish work at half six or seven, go back and go back again. But in the summer months, I used to go in there quite a lot and, Stand up, you know. I've got a friend of mine sponsors it, so we normally stood with him and had a had a beer and a bit of a chat. But I was looking forward to the last season. Really, it's a shame because um, it before obviously it got canned with the COVID thing. Um, it was shaping up to be good at Ipswich, you know, especially with Crumpy coming back and having that the mix of youth and experience in the team. I was really looking forward to, to watching it and the back on the top flight again. So. No disrespect to the next league down, but I think I would like to have seen the less meetings and more quality, which is what supposedly we should get with the top flight being back there. Yeah. What's your, what's your thoughts on the whole Polish thing? Do you think that should be allowed or do you reckon they, that they should just let the riders ride where they want to ride or what's your thoughts? The problem is I think Poland's been so prolific um, in the, in the, in the, in the wages these boys are earning there now, you know, I think I'd love to think there's there's 
they can all ride where they want to ride and they can do half a dozen meetings in Denmark and the season in Sweden, you know, do meetings in England. But the problem is, and you can't expect Brick Speedway to pay the sort of money, you know, they're, they're getting telephone numbers over there and at the end of the day you have to, if they say jump within reason, you're going to have to say how high because going back to what yeah. I said earlier, Poland is uh, the number one place in the world to make it in Speedway. And it's, it's, it can be a short, a short-lived career, you know, and it can finish at any time. You, you know, you well, look at, look at what happened to me. I wanted to ride another three or four years, but it got cut short. So there's mm -hmm. no prizes for there's no prizes for being loyal to to anyone. We'd all love to be like that, but at the end of the day, my advice to anyone that if their career's big in Poland, I'm afraid they have to bear, bread, butter their bread and and make that their their number one priority. As much as it, I hate to say it. Times have changed, and I used to be able to do all the leagues, but um, now it's changing for these boys, and I think they just have to make it while they can. And Poland is where it's at, you know. Yeah. And going back to when you're, I mean, you're. Do you believe that your top year was the year you won your world championship, or do you feel like you felt better on the bike a different Thank year? You, buddy. Do you feel like 2000, uh, 2000, the year you won the world championship? Do you feel like that was your best year? No. Funny enough, um, I rode so much better the year before, to be honest. Um, I think I I kind of kicked myself in the ass a bit because I, I'm i pretty sure the year before, I'm not saying my memory is yeah. terrible, I went out to the World Championship and I was a wild card. Um, and at the time, they basically put most of the rounds, put the best rider at the time, form-wise, outside of the Grand Prix, in the Grand Prix, which is great for me because at the time I think I was riding brilliant and um, I think I ended up that was, in That was in 1997, wasn't it? After, yeah, um, I, didn't, I think it was, pretty sure it was 99. And, um, okay, so, so you won a Swedish Grand Prix in, in 99 and oh, yeah, yeah, 1997, yeah. you won a D Danish one. That's right. Um, but yeah, going back to I mean, I rode, I rode well in 2000, but I, I do honestly feel that uh, 1999, I, personally, I was riding better. But I guess it's like anything, and it? You just go with it. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason. You can't put your finger on why things are going well or things aren't going well. You just go with it, you know, and you're enjoying riding your mm -hmm. bike, and it comes naturally, and you don't actually have to think about it, you know. When you, it's like Norrie, who, you know, worked for me for many years. He, you, you don't, you don't become a, a bad rider overnight but when you're out of form it doesn't matter what you're doing what engine you're using if if things aren't going right for yourself then it's not going to happen you have to just ride through it and wait for them to get better yeah so talking of nori um i uh, I, I did speak to him as well um and i said have you got any stories with with mark um and he did tell me about this trip i think he was driving through germany or something and he got got out well, for fuel. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, you want, do you want to tell people about that one? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I've told us a few times. Basically, long story short, within reason, we are uh, we're coming from. I think we're coming from Hans Erks in getting engines done in um, in Hanover, and driving up to Tommy Nutton's farewell meeting, and we stopped. We stopped. Uh, Nori quaffed and stopped for a cigarette and a coffee and a cheese roll. You know, in in that order, and. Uh, Basically, a lot of the time I'd be in the bed asleep because obviously, the, if it was night time, getting ready for the race the next day, uh, I'd jump out. And then this particular time, I think I jumped out literally in a t-shirt, a pair of jeans, and I was just stood in the back of my trainers like do. Uh, went for a piss in the bush, and um, I suddenly realised that off Norrie went. I came back to the van, and the van took off up the road. So um, next thing I know, uh, uh, obviously I'm sort of running after him. I thought, it's no problem. I'll go in and use a payphone. That's how long ago it was, because Norrie had just got a mobile phone. Now, bless him, it took a little while to adjust Norrie to any sort of modern, anything modern technology whatsoever. <laughs> this mobile phone was face down on the dash, turned off. So I'm ringing from a German, <laughs> oh, that was a, a German service station, trying to get hold of him. No, to no avail. I had no money on me. I borrowed money off the cleaners in the toilet. I just had a t shirt on, it was freezing. You had no anyway, shoes on either, did you? I eventually get a phone call three and a half hours later, 
um, to say he then turned around because the daylight had come and it was, the sun was coming up. And he used to then give me a shout to do a bit of driving so he could have sleep. And as he turned around, he realised that I wasn't there. But what <laughs> the biggest problem was, he'd stopped at another free service station since then. So he didn't know where I was. So long story short, <laughs> five hours later, he used to driven two and a half hours and five hours, two and a half hours back to find me at this petrol station. And uh, we carried on driving up to Voyance for Tommy Nudson's farewell meeting. And it was pissing my rain. And um, we thought, well, it's, it's not going to be on. But what we can't do is ring Tommy Nudson up and say, oh, I've left Mark in a petrol station. He'll think, yeah, that's the worst excuse for not turning up to a to a, a, a meeting where you ride for nothing you've ever heard, you know. So we carried on driving all out there flat out as quick as we could. We get there, we got there at heat too, just as it got abandoned. <laughs> wow. I mean, what, perfect timing, right? <laughs> and then, and then you have to tell them the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You're not going to yeah. believe what happened to us. And I, they, like you say, <laughs> if we had to rung them, if we had right. rung them and actually said, "Oh, Norrie's left me in a petrol station. We're not going to make it," it'd have been, you know, they thought, "Yeah, right. What a terrible excuse that is." It's not like, oh my God. but yeah, it was actually very true and uh, hilarious. Really, when you look back, that is that's um, crazy. Do Do we tell me? to ask you what happened to Norrie's chair. Apparently he had a favourite <laughs> chair. He said that, chair. Anyway, yeah, he was telling me he had a favourite chair that he used to sit in and watch TV or whatever, and you two had been out and you'd had a few beers or whatever, and then you thought, oh, this will be funny. So you uh, so you oinked the chair outside and smashed it up and set fire to it. Yeah, that's <laughs> Norrie right. wasn't. Yeah, Norrie wasn't used, very happy about it. We have to, used to have this fetish and stuff once we'd been. So, you know, it was either sometimes it was the odd car or Norrie's chair. Well, yeah, we just always used to come back to mine here because we had plenty of room to do what we wanted. We'd sort of have a bit of a party and Norrie's chair reaped it, you know. But I think Norrie's <laughs> probably along the line uh, had, had the last, last laugh, you know what I mean? He normally did. Brilliant. Hmm. That was um, funny. So... Well, there's a comment here um, from Craig Nevercott. Uh, Mark, you were my childhood hero. Gutted uh, you still didn't race for Exeter in the 2000s. Uh, my dad set up an email account for me when I was a kid. Um, Laramski at hotmail.com. And the confused look people give me when I still use the same email address 20 odd years later is brilliant. I will never change it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, mine's very similar. <laughs> weird. Weirdly enough, very similar. Not quite as many letters, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's funny. That they they were good days, Exa. I loved riding down there for two years. Yeah, it was really really good fun. It was a track that so you learned a lot of respect, and it made it even um, even made me sort of try and learn to make the starts a bit more because it was. You had to be very respectful of that place. That was pretty dangerous, really. When you look back, it's crazy what what we used to do, really. Yeah, and you you actually held the track record till the day that it, that it got bulldozed down, didn't you? Oh. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I held the track record. Um, I was on rails one morning. I think it was a, I think it was a two two o'clock um, start, and uh, I remember being really tired from being in Poland the day before and I am um, yeah just leaned it over and it was deep the track and I was just riding up the fence and just really enjoying myself and I, I looked back I was going over the finish line and I was probably straight in front or more and I thought it felt quick but you never really know but then they said obviously it was a track record um which like you say still still stands to this day and I think it was a track where um at that speed, I think it's the fastest inline speed on a British. I think it, someone said it was a Guinness Book of Records or something, but I don't know. But it's the fastest <laughs> inline speed in the straight line for a British UK track, apparently. But that's to be wow. verified. <laughs> was it smooth wow. that day? Was it was it smooth that day? Because it wasn't it wasn't very smooth, was it, Exeter? Oh, it was never smooth. <laughs> All right, bumps down the straight. And uh, off the the bot, the other the third and fourth corner, there was bumps down the straight. But if you timed it right, you straightened up, and you wheelied off the first bump, and then you backed down 
in the low spots of all the other bumps and then you put the front wheel down in the corner and then you didn't really feel the bumps at all it was a bit of a knack <laughs> but when you got in front you could do it and it was it was such a joy to ride when you're in front but um when you were behind it was very difficult to pick your moment i remember me and craig boyce had a race there once and we there's someone yeah, saying here in front of him, paul fry there's a crash of you paul fry and craig boyce is that, is that the same track the same race I had quite a few crashes there, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I remember, I remember crashing with Boyce. Here. It might have been the same one that Paul Fry was in as well. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a scary place. I remember it in that fence with me back, thinking, and I had this horrible burning sensation to go down my body in the floor. It doesn't never felt so relieved because it was obviously it was still boat panels, and I've never felt so relieved to be able to actually feel my legs and get up and walk away. You know, it was scary yeah this one this one here says uh mark does mark remember the crash at exeter with paul fry and craig boyce uh paul gated and both of the others caught him up uh, going into ben three real nasty got up and almost repeated it in the rerun <laughs> yeah mate i don't you know like i say i had so many run-ins around there but it was a uh... It was a it was a great track, but it was pretty narrow. So when things went wrong, they normally went wrong in a, you know, in a in a, in a big way. It was pretty nasty, really. Yeah, scary. You wouldn't be allowed that now, you know. Like obviously with all the air fence and things like that. But yes, solid steel fence. It was criminal. <laughs> I was watching yeah. videos from there the yeah. other day because my dad my dad was telling me if you want to learn how to ride a, a rough track, just watch videos from Exeter, and the good guys. They would go in so deep, like go going with so much speed and just bouncing down the straights and then go in so deep and run it up all the way to the fence and just basically just tap the fence and keep on going down the next straight. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Was it. Insane. Yeah, he's, he's right. That it it was it was one of them tracks you had to ride it on the edge or or you're not gonna you're just not gonna get around there right. And you like your dad said. You could either just clip the grass going in, ride straight up to the middle, and by the middle of the meeting, there was there was 18 inches of dirt up the fence. So you knew when you were proper on form, because then your back wheel would just hit that, and then you'd ride down, and you'd be in a straight line again, ready for the. So your dad was spot on, but you know he he was a master at doing that anyway. He said he said that's a, one of the scariest tracks he's ever ridden. <laughs> yeah. That, that's actually good because when I rode there for a couple of years, there were quite a lot of riders that were really good, but um, probably, probably not. I'm not saying were scared of the place, but they were a little. They were um, probably gave it a little bit too much respect. And for, for riders like me that come from grass track and I, I rough tracks and could ride them all right, but it did give me, for once, um, a slight bit of home. What I'd probably call a home track advantage, really, because um, there was quite a few riders. That went there that you know you'd really have there would be a real handful um take them to exeter and you know they, they all of a sudden they they weren't quite such a threat you know <laughs> i remember being there and carl stone here turned up and uh he, he sort of made a joke in the practice like they did like a parade lap or whatever and, and he he pulled out a trials bike saying this is what we need for riding around here sort of thing and then <laughs> i'm pretty sure he pulled out of the meeting because he didn't want to ride <laughs> Like he literally just pulled away from the start and just rode round two wheeling. But uh, we got one here from uh, Martin Nookie. Yeah, was... He said, uh, "I remember Mark at Exeter, um, which I have a photo from when he came for a night, and our bikes were left outside in the rain. He'd done a race with Simo Colsey and Simon Stevens, uh, which were all good at the time, and no one could touch you, Mark. What a legend!" Thank you. There you go. There's some <laughs> some praise coming out here, isn't there? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Not Here we go. Used to that these days. Mark and Wiggy, Wiggy. Wiggy were the dream team at Exeter. There you go. Yeah, it was, that was good because obviously Wiggy could ride a big rough track as well, so it was a good combination. I just had a couple of messages with uh, Simon Cross, and he was uh, I was out practicing the other day, and he was and he sent me a message and saying that you need to learn how to ride some grass track. He said, "Ask your dad about that." And I and I asked my dad, and my dad was like, "Oh no, I hated grass track." He said, "That's one of the <laughs> scariest things you've ever done, either, too." 
But then the, yeah, the, the grass the track. Grass. I was gonna say then the grass track boys actually don't like the speedway because they don't like the fence. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. That no, was all ropes, wasn't it? But um, but yeah, it was grass track was where like me and Screeny and Stony and Lovers came from, and it was big in back in the day. Um, but again, with Polish speedway getting so popular, uh, unfortunately, it did kill the grass track a lot. So um, it's a shame, really, because I think it did it did breed a good rider because tracks were always pretty rough and demanding so you, if you did if you did grass track and then you went to a rough speedway track it would be everyone would be complaining about it and you just think well there's nothing wrong this is this is fine you know you should have done the grass <laughs> track we did yesterday you know and that's what i think yeah, really yeah. brought the likes off me and screening on really wow brilliant so when's this uh when's this ride going to be with with you and screeny are we, are we going to get to see it or are you going to do it behind closed doors? Oh, no, I suppose you'll get, you might get to see something now on screening in his social media. Can't keep off it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, it'll be interesting. But with, hopefully if the weather gets better and we're all allowed to leave our counties and do something, that'll be all right, won't it, you know? But hopefully yeah. we'll get some racing in this year and we'll, we'll all get to see some speedway and um, we can yeah. move forward a bit more because it's been a, been a nightmare for everyone, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So, uh, have, you, have you got anything else to ask, Wilbur? Have we got any more questions? Anybody got any more questions in the comments? Ooh, here's a good one right here. What rider did you fear racing against? Um, I never really feared anyone as such. Um, again, I, I always knew you know, riding against the likes of um, Lee Adams and your dad was always going to be difficult because there was a lot of riders um, like, you know, you, you you could possibly pass or at least hassle to pass, but they were such good gators and they were so clinically clean at riding and such good lines that, you know, you would, you'd very seldom get past them. Um, so me being not such a good starter, it was always difficult for me and I'd always have that in the back of my mind, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to really jump out in front of them to be able to beat the likes of, you know, your, your dad and Lee, that were such good starters. But, you know, like I said earlier, in our era, we had, we had a bunch of riders that, you know, like, you know, uh, Greg, Gollum, Billy, you know, uh, Tony, Grumpy, and later on, Nicky and all the other, you know, it was, it, it was, a, it was a tough old lineup. Um, a funny story, because I rode with Nicky a couple of years and I actually got on really well with him, but, he, he was a, he was a nuisance on the track, as we all know. But um, I was said to him one night we were having a having a drink in a bar at Luton Airport, I think, in the in like this Novotel, you know. And um, I sort of said to him one night after being the night before, I was paired with Nicky at Eastbourne, and Crumpy was off of gate four. Nicky's off one, and I'm off gate three. And I know going in this corner that Nicky's just going to nail Crumpy every time. Four times this happened in heat fifteen. We ended up in the fence, and in the end, <laughs> the last two, the last two times, I just shut the throttle off. And I thought I know what's going to happen. Off they went again, straight in the fence, near enough having fifty cuffs, wanting to kill each other. Back on the bike. Anyway, when we actually finally got finished and we're sitting having a drink in this bar, I said, "Nicky, I said you can't help yourself, can you?" And he just laughed and he went, "No, I can't. I can't help." And I said, "If you were walking around like, you know." Asda or Tesco's, with, you know, supermarket trolley. I said, and your nan actually went past you to sort of like go and get something from the meat section. You would stick your own nan in the fridge, wouldn't you, and make her crack? You just can't help yourself. <laughs> you know? That's just. And he, he just laughed and went, "Yeah, yeah, you're right. I would." <laughs> he just, he's terrible. He just couldn't help himself. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I just we, I just we, got a message from my dad actually. Saying uh, Lauren and Joe scream were, for were uh, leg trailers from the, their grass track days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the leg yeah. trailers. That's right. Yeah, bit bit that's unorthodox, funny. really. But I suppose it worked the most of the time. But yeah, it wasn't really the right style for speedway. But I sort of brought something different to it, I guess, from grass track. <laughs> yeah, and you see a few riders that have the leg trailing style. I mean, it, it works for them, and that's what matters, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. you were world champion, so so, so it worked for a bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most of the lazy riders. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, here we go. Uh, Mark, do you go to do you go to Cardiff for the British Grand Prix? I've I've not been for two or three years, uh, but two or three years ago. Um, but no, I've not been for a while. But I was planning on going again soon because it's something you know it's amazing to go to. Really, it's a good occasion, yeah. um, brilliant atmosphere, and that. So uh, I think I'm due another visit soon. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure someone can sort you out some tickets. Yeah, you are. <laughs> they might remember me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will. All right, Mark. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll let you go, and then uh, we'll right, we'll, we'll no try and get you back on again another time. So uh, if you just stay behind, like when I put you backstage, just stay there, and we'll yeah. come and talk to you in a second. So uh, yeah, cheers. Right. Ah. How was that? That was cool. That, wasn't was, it? that was awesome. Even though we had a little bit of complications there with whatever we had, but <laughs> wow, what a what a show that turned out to be. Yeah, what a great insight as well. Like you know, you you, you see you see him on TV and things like that from his era. I mean, obviously you don't, Wilbur, because you was uh, five years before you were born. But Just you know, about. I remember him. I remember him from uh, from being on TV and you know and you, and you chat and hear all these stories that I've been hearing over the last few days and people calling. Um, you know, it's. It's it's great to hear, and you know, what what a what a achievement he had over the over the career he had. So definitely. Anyway, right. So uh, don't think no. So next week's guest isn't quite confirmed just yet, but uh, we will get that confirmed, and we'll get it out to you um, asap. Um, let us know what you think of the show. You know, send Mark any messages. He'll go through the comments afterwards and uh, and read what what you're all saying. And remember but, to tune uh, into our podcast. So I mean, if you missed oh, yeah. the show, or if your friends missed the show, make sure to go into Spotify, Apple. You can say Alexa, play uh, play Speedway the Speedway Chat, chat Show. show. Uh, hey Google, I mean anything like that. You play the Speedway Chat Show, um, and you can say that to all your friends who missed the live show, and you still get to watch it. Uh, you get. I don't know if you guys like those little small clips that we posted last week um with with nikki and them so that that was cool too uh with a little yeah. bit more polished up content so that was that was awesome yeah it's brilliant so um yeah check out oh i know what, what i didn't mention hmm. plymouth plymouth gladiators signing oh, yes. Diani pedersen wow it's big news um i have heard that there is another uh, rider being announced on saturday at 8 a.m so if you are interested in that um yeah check out plymouth gladiators for sure 8 a.m on saturday all right guys well um thanks for watching well, love you and leave you it's it was a great show and we'll uh speak to you soon peace Cheers.